and welcome to Worship With Me, Richard Bradshaw in the front bedroom of 12 Doctors Lane in Hutton Rugby where I live. Oh, hang on. I'm not slightly ambiguous. I did not mean worship with me in my front bedroom. I mean, I'm in the front bedroom and you worship wherever you are, yeah? Not only would you not all get into this front bedroom, I couldn't even let you into the house. Nor should you call on me, as I don't know where you've been or who with and... It would be unnecessary travel, and there isn't that much scope for social distancing in bedrooms. They're not designed for that. <sighs> this will be the weirdest and possibly most unsatisfactory Easter any of us will ever have experienced. But we are still going to say, Alleluia, Christ is risen. I didn't hear you. I said, Alleluia, Christ is risen. Oh, come on, there's a response. I say Christ is risen. You say he is risen indeed. Alleluia. Okay, let's try again. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. that have been adapted from collections produced by the Iona community and by Holyrood House in Thirsk. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, alleluia, risen in quiet and mysterious darkness before the chorus of dawn, risen with glory and grace in reserve, risen to prove that violence is no solution, to offer us peace and life in all its fullness. Alleluia! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia! For God has taken into his own flesh the sin of the world. God has the last laugh. For freedom 
comes beyond the cross. For peace comes beyond the violence. For friendship comes beyond the betrayal. For life comes beyond the crushing of life. The first laugh and the last laugh are God's. And God has made laughter for us. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. In this moment, we are gathered, welcoming love's return. Our hearts are lifted. We open our eyes. We welcome love. The tomb is empty. The stone laid back. The stones cry out for joy. Risen one, stand among us, speak your words of peace. Release us from our fears, heal us from our wounds. Forgive our betrayals, our denials of your love, that we may participate in your just living. Holy dancer, your soar from the grave with cosmic rhythm, wiping earth's tears in holding the dawn. Hold our hands in the dance of justice, Weave our steps into spirals of freedom. After the Sabbath, as Sunday morning was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake. An angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled the stone away and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid that they trembled and became like dead men. The angel spoke to the women. You must not be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has been raised, just as he said. Come here and see the place where he was lying. Go quickly now and tell his disciples. He has been raised from death and now he is going to Galilee ahead of you. There you will see him. Remember what I have told you. So they left the tomb in a hurry, afraid and yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, Peace be with you. They came up to him, took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Do not be afraid, Jesus said to them. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. Thanks be to God.
There's a wonderful moment in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where Arthur Dent is getting seriously exasperated with the spaceship's drinks vending machine. It is supposedly programmed to provide for him a beverage perfectly tailored to his preferences, but it never does. The liquid it spews out is always a disgusting, undrinkable goo. Is it too much to ask for a nice cup of tea? Apparently so, and Arthur despairs. Then comes a quote which meant so much to me it sat on my desk for years in a little frame. Arthur Dent decided to give up. Then he decided he'd be damned if he was going to give up. And he does eventually persuade the machine to make him some decent tea. Having in the process compromised the spaceship's computing capacity so much it becomes vulnerable to alien attack. <laughs> After Good Friday, the temptation is to give up. The machine has won. In this case, the machine that is the Roman Empire. It has proved itself resistant to all protest. Jesus might have been innocent. The crowd might have been manipulated into shouting for Barabbas. Pilate's wife might have had nightmares, but never mind any of that. Crucify and have done with it. It's as well not to argue with the kind of people for whom crucifixion is a routine way to dispose of enemies. It's as barbaric as any that have ever been devised. Give up and resign yourselves, people. The guys with the firepower, or in this case the nail power, have triumphed as they always will. What happened next is open to interpretation, but it's a matter of historical record that a generation later, a substantial number of communities based on devotion to the one who had been crucified, had sprung up and were gaining influence. The church had come into being. The next bit was excites me. A little bit of calculation using the kind of incidental detail from Paul's letters that there could have been no point in making up shows that by the time of his conversion, less than 20 years after the death of Jesus, the church was already strong enough for a man of Paul's stature to consider it worth persecuting. That doesn't give long for the Jesus movement to have formed itself around the extraordinary claim that he who was dead now lived and was seated at the right hand of God. At some point, the apostles had decided they'd be damned if they were going to give up. The machine had not won. Death had not had the final word. There's a time and a place to dispute the historical accuracy of the empty tomb stories, and this isn't it. For now, I'd say this. I doubt if the efforts to prove that there was an empty tomb on Easter Sunday morning had ever borne much fruit. It doesn't seem to me that's why and how people come to faith. I've never heard it quoted in a testimony. We do ourselves no favours in claiming solid historical evidence for it, like we're all professional historians with no apologetic axe to grind, because what happens when you ask someone who is a professional historian? You get this. Historians are never going to make sense of these reports, unless, like some of those who first heard them, they choose to regard them as simply ludicrous. Nevertheless, they can hardly fail to note the extraordinary galvanising energy of those who spread the story after their experience of resurrection and ascension. Those are the words of Dermot McCulloch, one of the most formidable church historians around, who narrowly missed teaching me or do I mean I narrowly missed being taught by him? He was appointed to the college where I trained for ministry the year I left. He calls himself a critical friend of Christianity, and compared with some others you might read from entirely secular historians, his is indeed a friendly judgment. So concentrate on the positive thing, he says. There was an extraordinary galvanising energy among those who spread the story. They were the damned if we're going to give up brigade. What made them like that? Dare I suggest... Exactly the same reason that put the steel into Arthur Dent. The recognition that if you let the machine beat you, you have surrendered your humanity. Something happened within the experience of, it's thought especially Peter, Mary Magdalene and the other key apostles, a vision. An invincibly authentic experience that made them say, no, Pilate hasn't won, that cannot be so. Jesus is alive, we can feel it. How does Paul describe the resurrection as a sequence, not of events in Jerusalem, but of visionary moments, times when people saw the Lord, knew he was alive, for which the, what we call, evidence may not have been there. Some of those visions were a long way from Jerusalem, and those who experienced them could not have been along to check the facts on the ground. 
I imagine that most of you watching or listening would say that you believe in the resurrection, whatever you might mean by that. But let's ask what is at stake, and I suggest again that is not the contents of a tomb in Jerusalem. It's your sense, our sense, of who has won if the resurrection is not true. Pilate won. Force of arms and cruelty won. The popular vote, give us Barabbas, won. The conniving Jewish leaders won. Money-grubbing, treacherous, manipulative, da -da -da -da, whatever it was, Judas won. The disciples ran away, making the victory of all those malign forces all the simpler. The good men who did nothing so that evil triumphed, do you know the saying? And the losers were justice, a vision of a transformed world, human liberation, kindness, everything that Jesus stood for, healing, forgiveness, generosity, service to one's neighbour, all those ideals got crucified with him and they did not rise from the dead. You don't believe that. I don't believe that. But imagine that you did. What sort of a world would we have? The world of tyrants and tycoons, of arms dealers and shysters, profiteers, hypocrites, time-serving toadies, a world where greed is good, where money swears, where self-interest is king and your neighbour can beg on street corners and all you'll throw in his cap is a dime left in your wallet from your last trip to the States. A world where you don't support the food banks because the interest rates are such rubbish. That's Pilate's world, Judas's world, Caiaphas's world, Herod's world, Hitler's world. It's North Korea, maybe it's Putin's Russia, the world of a few other populist autocrats one might mention. And not only do you not want that world, you cannot live as though the world is like that. You cannot consistently live as though the resurrection is not true, but you can live as though it is. And most of the time, most of us do, even if we don't necessarily make that connection. We live as though mighty empires always get up themselves and topple, as though greed is rather pathetic. Where, when the king of self abdicates in favour of the king of love, you wonder why you didn't do it before. Right now, to be duly topical, as I think we must be, it feels like the machinery of lockdown is a tyrant, but we know why we must surrender to it, and that it's only a temporary measure put in place to help us defeat a nasty little enemy called Covid-19. For some, because of the hardship this entails, loss of freedom, of security, of human contact, there may be a temptation to give up. But then we say no. We're damned if we're going to give up. We can see this through and we'll do it together. Using all the tools of virtual communication that some of us have had to learn fast. We can only live as if resurrection is true because otherwise there is no life. We are coping with the virus, cruel as it is and harsh as the restrictions are. There is a wealth of humour bubbling up as one of the best defences around. Tyrants cannot bear to be laughed at. The story that we tell ourselves to one another, to our children, is crucial. And here's a story that many believe. Thirteen and odd billion years ago, space-time went bang, and as it so happened, the result was a universe in which there was the possibility of life emerging, should conditions on a particular planet be favourable. On this planet they were, and we're here. But on the cosmic scale of things, human existence has only been around for the blink of an eye. In a few billion years' time, not only will we all be long gone, so will the Earth. Because the Earth will have been gobbled up by the Sun, expanding into a red giant, before it finally dies and goes cold. Perhaps the whole universe will die and go cold. Or it might go into reverse, collapse back into itself in a reversal of the Big Bang, the Big Crunch. When I last checked, scientists weren't sure which of those scenarios is the more probable, but they won't be around to tell you, I told you so, if they guessed right and someone else guessed wrong. Now, if that is not only the story, but the whole story, then our straits are direr than I know how to convey. Among other things, it implies that the emergence of consciousness from the evolutionary process is the cruelest twist of fate imaginable, because it's created a race of beings who are not only part of a mindless cosmic drama that no one is watching with no proper ending but only infinite darkness, but who know that? Oh, God, spare us such knowledge, except that on that premise there is no God or not one who loves us. We are stuck with this affliction of being aware that one day we will no longer be here 
or anywhere else, and there is nothing we can do to change our circumstances, although alcoholic and other escape routes may be guileless. The cosmos is itself a mindless machine that calls every shot there could possibly be, and you can't live as though that's the whole truth. You go nuts. But you can live as though the story needs to be filled out and has been. As though we are, despite all the horrors, pains, unfairnesses of life, we are meant well towards. I can live, I can function well on the basis that that is true, but not if the universe is mindless and our minds are just chemistry. What that well-meaningness ultimately means for me and for all of us, I we can't say, but I trust it, and that's why I call myself a believer in the risen Lord and thus a Christian. Resurrection faith is God's yes but to Roman cruelty, to the apparent finality of the death penalty. Yes, you killed an innocent man who preached a life-changing message, but if you imagine that's the end of it, think again. You cannot crush a vision by executing the visionary. Hitler famously advised the British to shoot Gandhi, and if this doesn't suffice to reduce them to submission, shoot a dozen leading members of the Congress, and if that doesn't suffice, shoot 200, and so on, as you make it clear that you mean business. Doubtless Hitler would have done, but we may be inclined to doubt whether that would have destroyed the Indian yearning for independence. I dare say there's now a price on Greta Thunberg's head, but does anyone suppose that assassinating her would do anything but redouble the strength of the movement she not altogether intentionally started? Cruel empires fall as they overreach themselves and run out of energy. Hitler's dream of the thousand-year Reich was doomed by its grandiosity, and his policy of indiscriminate bombing did not ultimately destroy morale, but harden the Allies' resolve to see him in hell. There are some vile tyrannies in the world today, and to our shame we arm them and profit by the trade. But when they fall, as one day they must... Will their liberated people decide as a matter of simple justice that they will never trade with us again in weapons or anything else? We are called to live justly, not profitably. And there are those in our world who need reminding that there's a difference. Remember, remember, says resurrection faith, the tyrant's days are numbered, even if you personally will not live to see their end, even though, like Hitler, like Mao, like Stalin, they may kill you by the million. They cannot kill the hope of freedom. So don't you throw in your lot with them now, while they are in the ascendancy. Here's the message of resurrection. Love calls the shots. Love thumbs its nose at tyrants. Love gets beaten up and comes back for more. Love is like Kenny in South Park who gets killed in every episode. He'll be back for the next one and get killed again, but that won't stop him. Love won't let little things like death and torture stand in its way. Machines don't win, whether they are political machines, economic machines, ecclesiastical machines. And yes, the church has, in centuries gone by, taken on machine-like qualities. So don't be their servants. Don't defer inside yourself to their presumed authority, whatever lip service it may be prudent to pay them. Be damned if you're going to give up, right? Future times may call for plenty of resistance to the global machine that seems to prioritise economic growth above the survival of the human species, without which there won't be an economy at all. But hopefully, as I said last week, we may be learning from the pandemic that there are sacrifices worth making if something crucial is at stake, like our health service or our future on this planet. The machine must not win. Resurrection faith said it didn't, won't, never can, but love well, Arthur decided to give up. It was Good Friday, and Jesus was dead. Then he decided he'd be damned if he was going to give up, because inside him there had been a dead weight of despair, sealed in a tomb that suddenly and inexplicably had burst open, and the dead weight was gone. It was Easter, and he was seeing everything in a new light. We cannot live as though it's still Good Friday, but we can as though it's Easter. And we can do that every day from here on. Jesus won, machine nil. So never let them grind you down. Amen and Alleluia. Oh, happy Easter. Happy Easter, everybody. It, it was a wonderful place and we do miss yeah. you all. It, it was a wonderful time.
a wonderful time. In the peace of Christ, we welcome the lighter evenings, enjoying the lengthening days, birdsong and new life in the fields, calling us into thanksgiving, surrounded by signs of hope and a new tomorrow. We listen to the sounds of earth, declaring the wonders of creation. We praise the source from whom it springs. Spring catches us with its unexpected glories of God. Buds of promise push through the wintry corners of our hearts. We dare to take new risks facing new encounters. The blossoms of the blackthorn breaks through the sharpness of wintry waiting. The birds put on a free concert every sunrise. Humbly, we acknowledge the earth's gifts and the source of life. Come spirit of the spring, infuse us with passionate desire for justice in the earth. Enthuse us with your compassion. Refuse our excuses not to follow your call. Our prayers this Easter day come from the Christian Aid website. Prayers in a time of coronavirus. Love never fails. Even in the darkest moments, love gives hope. Love compels us to fight against coronavirus alongside our sisters and brothers living in poverty. Love compels us to stand together in prayer with our neighbours near and far. Love compels us to give and act as one. Now it is clear that our futures are bound together more tightly than ever before. And as we pray in our individual homes, around the nation and around the world, we are united as one family. So let's pause for a moment of peace as we lift up our hearts together in prayer. A prayer for a global pandemic. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things and endures all things. Love never ends. Corinthians 13 verses 7 to 8. Loving God, strengthen our innermost being with your love that bears all things even the weight of this global pandemic, even the long haul of watching for symptoms and patiently waiting for all of this to pass, watching and waiting, keeping our gaze fixed on you and looking out for our neighbours near and far. Instill in our shaken stalls the belief and hope that all things are possible with your created love, for strangers to become friends, for science to source solutions, for resources to be generously shared so everyone, everywhere, may have what they need. That your perfect love that knows no borders may cast out any fear and selfishness that divides. May your love that never ends be our comfort, strength and guide for the well-being of all and the glory of you, our Lord. A prayer for the church. May your love that never fails strengthen the weak. Encourage the fearful, calm the anxious and heal the sick through your church, your washed hands and feet on earth, distant but still present, virtual but still connected, apart but still helping. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Lord, we give our thanks for the health workers tending the seriously ill, for the scientists working on a vaccination, for the researchers analysing data and identifying trends, for the media outlets working to communicate reality, for the supermarket workers, hygiene and sanitation providers, for the good news stories of recoveries and effective planning, for the singing from balconies by lockdown communities, for the recognition that isolation doesn't need to mean loneliness, for the notes through letterboxes offering help and support, for the internet and telephones and technology that connects, for the awakened appreciation of what is truly important, thanks be to God. For those who are unwell and concerned for loved ones, for those who were already very anxious, for those immune suppressed or compromised, for those vulnerable because of underlying conditions, for those in the most at risk to coronavirus categories, 
For those watching, their entire income stream dry up. For those who have no choice but to go out to work. For those who are afraid to be at home. For those who are more lonely than they've ever been. For those who are bereaved and grieving. God be their healer, comfort and protection. Be their strength, shield and provision. Be their security, safety and close companion. And raise up your church to be your well-washed hands and faithful feet. To be present to the pain and to respond with love in action, if even from a safe distance. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. A prayer for times of isolation. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans chapter 8 verses 38 to 39. God of heaven and earth in these times of isolation. We are apart from loved ones, distant from friends, away from neighbours. We thank you that there is nothing in all of creation, not even coronavirus, that is able to separate us from your love. And may your love that never fails continue to be shared through the kindness of strangers looking out for each other. For neighbours near and far, all recognising our shared vulnerability, each of us grateful for every breath and willing everyone to know the gift of a full and healthy life. Keep us all in your care. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. A prayer for medical workers everywhere. Restoring and healing God. Thank you for medical workers everywhere, embodying sacrificial love in these challenging times, putting the welfare of others before their own. Staying away from their family and loved ones. Comforting the concerned and bereaved. Reassuring the anxious and vulnerable, and working to heal and restore people who are ill. Be their guide, strength, wisdom and hope. We pray for those in authority to do right by them, for proper protective equipment to be provided, and for their dedication to be met with much gratitude and appreciation when they return home exhausted. And we pray for medical workers around the world, where resources and protective equipment are in short supply, not only now, but always. May these extraordinary times lead to deep and necessary changes in how our world works, resulting in a genuine effort to address the profound injustice of life expectancy be determined by geography, to awaken us all to the reality of how connected we all are, and to work together to create the community and the world we all want to be part of. So help us, God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we seek your presence in the silence beyond words, looking to you for comfort, strength, protection and reassurance. Breathing with gratitude, holding on to hope, trusting with faith that you are still God in the midst of turmoil and that your love reaches to the ends of the earth. Be present with each of us now. Amen.
gentle earth, bathe us in the promise of Christ's peaceful presence, especially when we feel afraid. And may the peace between us reflect the promise of Christ's peace to the world. The blessing and the source of our life, the love of Jesus and the boldness of the Spirit be with each of us and all who need comfort and strength today and always. Mm -hmm.